Hey, it's your old pal Lucid Stew again. In this video, I'm going to lay down my argument for why and when high-speed rail is a good infrastructure decision in the United States. This will then segue into videos where I take a closer look at each of the 10 Federal Railroad Administration high-speed rail corridors, what is being done to build high-speed rail in those, what high-speed rail would look like in each of those corridors if politics and cost were removed, and then look at what might actually be accomplished in a reasonable time frame. It may not seem like it, but high-speed rail in the United States is not a new idea. The federal government has somewhat seriously been kicking the idea around since the 60s when the Shinkansen was opened in Japan. The interstate highway system and jet air travel rose to prominence in the 1950s, and a large part of the U.S. expanded with and in accordance with those modes of transit over the ensuing decades. Combined with the relatively spread out nature of U.S. urban areas outside of the Northeast, this has kept the demand for high-speed rail to a minimum on a national scale. As a result, passenger rail service in the U.S. is in roughly the same place it was 50 years ago, and various efforts to kickstart high-speed rail in the United States have struggled to get off the ground. However, the United States has changed over the last 60 years. The population has doubled, Formerly mid-tier cities in the South and West have grown significantly and the population distribution of the country has moved from the general direction of the Northeast and Great Lakes region to the West and Southeast coasts. Our population densities and the distances between them have changed. The spread of the suburbs has started pushing the limits of the transit systems that facilitated their growth. Urban areas that have seen population declines during the move to the suburbs are now seeing population growth again. The demand for a third mode of medium distance travel between urban areas is growing. In the 1990s, the FRA laid out several high-speed rail corridors to facilitate improvements of passenger rail in those changing areas to meet the need. That idea has now been morphing over the last 30 years into what we have now, 10 corridors and the defunct Florida corridor. The extant high-speed rail corridors are as follows. The California corridor, which is synonymous with California high-speed rail. The Chicago hub, formerly known as the Midwest corridor, connecting about a dozen major cities across 10 states near the Great Lakes. The Empire State corridor from New York to Niagara Falls. The Gulf Coast Corridor, which is Houston to Atlanta via New Orleans with a spur to Mobile, Alabama. The Keystone Corridor from Philadelphia to Pittsburgh. The Northeast Corridor from Washington, D.C. to Boston, which is home to Acela service. Acela is the only passenger train in the U.S. that technically qualifies as true high speed with a top speed of 150 miles per hour, soon to increase to 160. The Northern New England Corridor, connecting most of the New England states with the NEC, Empire State Corridor, and Montreal, Canada. The Pacific Northwest Corridor, from Portland, Oregon, to Vancouver, British Columbia, via Seattle. The South Central Corridor, from San Antonio, into both Oklahoma and Arkansas, via Dallas-Fort Worth and the Southeast Corridor from Washington, D.C. to Jacksonville, Florida. In reality, most of these are passenger service improvement plans, and the pace on these improvements is pretty slow. You're not looking at a bunch of shiny new 200 mile per hour trains. You're looking more like Amtrak's planned aero service. This service will use Siemens Charger locomotives. These locomotives have a top speed of 125 miles per hour on routes that are aiming for 110 mile per hour top speeds for the most part. There are different variants of the Charger currently in service at 110 miles per hour top speed on some Amtrak routes. They're combining with Siemens Venture cars to present very capable and modern potential. And the reason I say potential is that these will use the same old routes shared with freight will need new track, route, and control upgrades to increase speeds in most parts of the route, and this will take time. Even then, they won't be all that fast. A good example of the intermediate target on a lot of these lines is the Lincoln service between Chicago and St. Louis. This line recently completed an upgrade to significantly extend 110 mile per hour service. 
This cuts about 45 minutes off the old service, getting between the two cities in a little over four hours. It could average about 67 miles per hour. There is potential to improve this further. I'd argue if you could run a route like this consistently at 110 miles per hour and average something like 80 miles per hour, that's solid regional commuter service. But we're not talking about commuting with commuter rail, are we? We're talking about high-speed rail connecting urban areas at speed and at scale in a way that slots between road and air traffic at mid-range. This is going to require a lot of dedicated track, and most of these corridors aren't moving in that direction, or at least not in any hurry. Why even bother with high-speed rail? Why not just have these medium high-speed trains all over the place? Because each transit mode has its place and does things well. Walking is for short distances. Bikes and small electrics are good under about 10 miles when properly facilitated and the weather is good. Subways and light rail will get you around a dense urban area well, but they can be expensive and inefficient or impractical to run everywhere. Commuter rail gets you from a fixed point to that urban transit network, but you're generally limited to rail right-of-ways that already exist because suburban expansion has consumed most of the land around city centers. A passenger vehicle will get you from wherever you are to wherever you want to be relatively quickly over short to medium distances. It doesn't make much sense over walking distances or if a very short transit option exists. On the long end, most people aren't going to drive more than five or six hours in a day. Yeah, it's possible, but practical upper limit there is roughly 300 miles. Air travel will get you there pretty quickly over long distance, but you're probably not going to fly a distance of less than 200 miles or so. And really until about 400 miles, you're spending as much time boarding, deboarding, taxiing, taking off and landing as you are in the air so you benefit less from the plane being able to go 550 miles per hour. That leaves some space in the roughly 200 mile to 400 mile range where maybe driving or commuter rail or flying aren't the best choice. Insert high speed rail. A train is going to be a more expensive trip than driving even for one passenger. Rail won't get you directly from A to B. Thereby, rail has to be significantly faster over distance than driving to be the more attractive option in most cases. 100 miles in a car can be done in about 1 hour and 45 minutes, assuming traffic isn't too bad. Commuter rail, roughly the same time to get you there, never mind all the time to get to the station, wait for the train, and connect on the other end. High-speed rail averaging 150 miles per hour will get you there in 40 minutes. Everything else considered, you probably get to your destination in roughly the same time as a car at that distance. Here, high-speed rail is at least competitive time-wise on the very low end. Extend that to 200 miles and you pick up another 50 minutes in high-speed rail's favor. Our commuter rail is competitive time-wise with a car, but still more expensive and less convenient. Of course, both rail modes gain time if your origin and destination are closer to the station on either end. On the longer end, let's compare a 400 mile flight to high speed rail. Time to and from the station or airport is about the same. You'll need an extra hour at least at the airport to get through security and board the plane. Flight time is only about 45 minutes, but you're going to be taxiing, taking off, landing and deboarding for probably another half hour. So three hours, 15 minutes total and some hassle with security, plus planes are cramped if you're in coach and there is nearly always an issue with overhead luggage space. High-speed rail gets you there 40 minutes slower, but less hassle, more comfortable, maybe a little more expensive. It's competitive. Beyond that distance, air travel starts pulling away, but the faster the train can go, the more competitive it gets over a wider distance range. So we have this two to 400 miles space that high-speed rail fills very nicely. A train averaging 80 miles per hour cannot pull this off unless an area is more dense like the Northeast Corridor. It has to be a fast train because most of the rest of the country has significant space between urban areas. When we're looking at our high-speed rail vision for America, an upgrade isn't adequate. And this ignores the transformative potential of a real high-speed network that plugs well into all of the other transit networks. We need new rights-of-way for fast trains to accomplish this. 
I think people need to understand that high-speed rail has a very good and specific purpose. That purpose isn't to get you from coast to coast. You're looking at nearly an entire day in a fast train compared to five to six hours flying. Would someone use it? Sure. Would enough use it to justify the cost? No. Is the purpose of high-speed rail to stop every five minutes at every podunk place with a population over 5,000? No. These are fast trains meant to travel from density to density over a distance of roughly 200 to 400 miles. But we're not going to get this unless we really push for it in a way that makes sense. Instead, we're going to get the version that doesn't work anywhere near as well between 200 and 400 miles and then wonder why Amtrak fails no matter how much money we throw at it. Or we're going to get the version that detours 50 miles to make half a dozen unnecessary stops, launching the cost into the stratosphere and putting the whole idea into question. There are mostly good versions of this, like Texas Central and others that at least recognize new right-of-way is necessary, like Cascadia High-Speed Rail in the Northwest and California High-Speed Rail. I will be covering those while going through each of the previously mentioned High-Speed Rail corridors and Brightline Florida in their own videos over the next few months. Plenty more High-Speed Rail action to come, but that's all for now. Until next time, I'll see you on that big beautiful freeway.